The Cartoonrific Podcast is sponsored by the Wonderful World of Animation Gallery, home of rare and wonderful fine animation art. Visit their website at www.gallery.com. And for our Cartoonrific listeners, you will receive a special 10% discount off any purchase if you purchase by March 25th, 2024. Just go to www.gallery.com and enter code CARTOON10 for your 10% discount. Once again, this discount is only valid until midnight, March 25th, 2024. Once again, visit www.gallery.com. The following is a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. It's Cartoonerific. 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 It's Cartoonerific. The show that talks with. Well, welcome back to the Cartoonerific Podcast, Classic Animated Cartoons. My name is Brian Mitchell, and I'm your host. Last week, we uh, talked with Matthew Bates, who is an Emmy Award-winning animator and character designer. He's pretty darn good. Uh, he, I've worked with him on a lot of different things, and uh, I was surprised one day I was working on a show called Little Dogs on the Prairie. It was a um, Christian uh, animated show. And I, what was funny was uh, the, the company I was working for sent over the designs of the characters, and I really liked the designs. And I didn't know, I had no idea who did them, but I, I really love them. They're very animatable, uh, very cute very cute, appealing designs. And so I ended up storyboarding, uh, I think it was maybe a a couple of acts of that show. They only did maybe about, I I don't I think it was maybe three, three to six half hours, maybe about three half hours. So I did one of the half hours, but it wasn't until I was going through Matt's uh, resume uh, before uh, recording the podcast that I saw that he had worked on this show. And he was the character. He was the character designer, and uh, it blew me away because uh, I didn't. I didn't recognize it, and I should have because you know, thinking about it, I'm like, oh my god, uh, you know, I. It all made sense. I was like, oh, this was his design. This was definitely his work. So, the, you know, you, you learn things from doing. Uh, podcasts like this you you learn things about people uh, i know matt learned a few things about me as we were talking in the first episode so uh this episode matt's going to go into uh some of the things that he's worked on in the uh, last week he was talking about meeting frank thomas who is a, a, a one of the, disney's nine old men one of their greatest animators and um he he met frank thomas when he was uh still a teenager, Mr. Thomas gave him some advice on what to do as far as training goes. And uh, I'm sure that was a a thrill for him. And uh, it would have been for me. I know, I know for sure that would have been a a big thrill for me uh, to meet him. I ended up meeting him later on, much later on. But anyway, Matt this week is going to be talking about uh, working for Jim Henson, meeting Jim Henson, going to be talking about Stan Lee, because uh, at the same time when he was working on Muppet Babies, he ended up uh, meeting Stan Lee and became friends with Stan Lee or friendly with Stan Lee. 
and then later on went to Disney and then Don Blue Studios. So he'll be talking about that in this episode of the Cartoonerific Classic Animated Cartoon Podcast. We will be back after this message. Cartoonerific is the place to be to celebrate hand-drawn animated cartoons. The Cartoonerific podcast features interviews with the magic makers behind your favorite animated cartoons with episodes uploaded every Friday. Or visit the Cartoonerific blog featuring articles about classic cartoon animation. At the Cartoonerific gallery, view original animation art and memorabilia from your favorite animated films and TV shows. The company store features exclusive swag from the Cartoonerific universe. And coming soon, brand new world premiere cartoons on the Cartoonerific channel. It's all here. Join the fun at www.cartoonerific.com. That's cartoon, E-R-I-F-I-C dot com. It's Cartoonerific, saving the universe one funny cartoon at a time. Hi, this is Brian Mitchell. Welcome back to the Cartoonerific podcast, classic animated cartoons. So as I was saying, uh, our guest this week is Matt Bates. It's part two of our interview. You know, when you do these uh, podcasts, uh, you record, and the way this went was uh, it it was just a lot of fun. It was good material, and we just kept going uh, because generally um, these podcasts are planned for about 40 to 50 minutes each. But here, instead of letting it run into two hours, figured we would break this up into parts. And last week, it seemed to be all about inspirations. Inspirations, what uh, what led Matt into getting into the field of animation, uh, early inspirations, and then uh, things he did later on to get into school. So uh, what's interesting about these podcasts, what's really interesting to me is the fact that I learn things, and and same thing with Matt. He learned things from uh, just talking about uh, our inspirations and stuff like that. We never went that deep. And maybe we might have mentioned, like, yeah, I used to watch The Wonderful World of Color when I was a kid, or, you know, or I used to love Yogi Bear. But uh, after doing this podcast and really uh, delving a little bit deeper into those inspirations and what he had to do to to, to learn cartooning or to learn life drawing uh, and then uh, apply that into uh, his school work it was just very, very interesting for me. I, so I, I learn a lot of new things from, from this podcast. So I'm hoping to learn a lot more going into the future. So anyway, uh, here we go. This is uh, part two of our interview with Matt Bates. And here he'll be talking about his work at Marvel Studios, which was on Muppet Baby, so he had uh, uh, a co connection with Jim Henson and, believe it or not, the legendary Stanley Two Legends. And then uh, uh, going into his work on, of all things, Teddy Ruxpin, Disney, and uh, with Don Bluth working as an animator. So here it is, our interview with Matt Bates. No, I I want to I want to kind of move away from this and maybe talk about uh, Muppet Babies because uh, you know yeah. I wanted to work for Henson. Oh really? When I, yeah, when I was a kid, I wanted, and I actually corresponded oh, well, that's with Jim right. Henson you did, in New York. Yeah, you made puppets. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. sure. But I corresponded with Jim Henson. I used to call him up on. He would be at the studio on Saturdays because the studio. Well, was he's in a New York, York guy too, isn't he? He's from New York. Yeah, he was on. He, he, from, he was on East Sixty Seventh Street in Manhattan. And, wow. And so uh, right across the way is Long Island City, and that's where my, fa my father would have to work on Saturdays. He was a supervisor. And uh, so I'd take a ride in with him and kind of hang out with right. him. And I would uh, call Jim Henson. <laughs> I got the number of Henson Associates, and I called him on the telephone. But, um, how, old, how old were you? Oh, God, 12, 11. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was going to so say, I, I, I was going to say you're number. a little older, but you were 11? I was like 11, yeah. And, uh, wow, so, yeah, you so called I, him. Yeah, so I I had the number because it was in the in the phone book. And so I called on Saturday not expecting anybody to be there. And 
sure enough, somebody picked up the phone, and he was the only only person there. Really? And I'd say, hi, could I speak to Jim Henson? You know, it, it wasn't this voice. It was a... <laughs> yeah, probably lisping like crazy, but uh, yeah, but he would, it, and then he would say speaking, and no then way. basically my drawers dropped, and I probably urinated all over the floor. <laughs> yeah, so, but, oh my yeah, gosh, was, are you serious? Yeah, and I was like, how many? I never heard this and, story. Oh yeah, yeah, this is and great. So I used to, I used to write him. I used to write him, you know, how do you do this and how do you do how do you make the puppets and cuz you know they never seem to have seams, right? And uh so I eventually found that out. I mean, it was uh, a a type of fleece that they used, but right. But yeah, uh yeah, but he would send back a letter and it'd be signed in, in green ink Jim Henson. So I actually corresponded with people. It was uh wow, it's pretty neat. And I, that, I don't that, have those letters, unfortunately, because uh, you know what? That's funny. You know, seeing letters, I I can't find that letter. I, you know, that uh, Frank Thomas sent me. Yeah, it's somewhere in a box. It's somewhere in Four Winds. I don't know. It, it's gone. Yeah, and I, I look back on that, and it's just like, wow. Yeah, and well, nobody, and and I believe you, but you know, but people, you know, I'm sure there's going to be people. Yeah, yeah I'd sure, like to see sure. a letter. Where's the letter? letter? Yeah. Show me a letter, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 I, I just. I was just, you know, I, I didn't, I, I never, I never was the kind of person to run up to somebody and ask for their autograph. I wasn't that kind of person. I would like to, I want like you on the phone with Jim Henson. I'd rather just talk to him and hear there's just talk to him face to face and just talk to him. I wouldn't get an autograph and run, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's like, I just like to be in their presence, just talk to him and talk to him about what they did and how they got there. And, you know, no matter how little I was, I mean, that's the way I was. It was, just, you know. So you were in Cal- you were in California, so you were like yes. like in their backyards, you know. Well, I mean, not, yeah, not exactly. Yeah. I know you're. I know you were up north. I know yeah, up, yeah, yeah. You know, like our drive. You know. Yeah. For me, but what t- what town was well, it? You again? Know, what town were you? Uh, I was born in Sacramento. From yeah, Sacramento, California. Yes. Yeah, born and raised. Born and raised, man. Yeah. So and, uh, yeah, I had uh, what was funny was here we had the New York animators, so you had. Right. Um, Okay. And there were a lot of good ones too. There were some good ones. Preston Blair actually lived in Westport, and really? Mary Blair lived up in Great Neck, Westport, Connecticut. That's where Preston Blair was. So about an hour's drive from where I lived, and Mary Blair, Mary Blair? lived about eight miles yeah. away from me on the North Shore. Now, now she was she was from there, right? Is that where she grew up, or what was her story? No, Mary Blair. no, she married she married Lee Blair, who was yeah, uh, Lee a, Blair, right? He was a commercial or I guess designer too, right? An animator, great, maybe. great, great, um, uh, a California impressionist. I mean, he's a great yes, yeah, yes, phenomenal. And uh, they built they I guess uh, they decided to come to New York. They bought a house. Uh, they didn't buy a house. They had a house constructed. In Great right. Neck, the house is there. It's still there. Right. It sure. looks like something from outer space landed. Um, oh, it's on, uh, oh, God, it's on Beach Road or something like that up in Great Neck. But uh, so basically you could see New York from Great Neck. If you go to the right. the shore there, you could see the, the island of Manhattan. But, uh, yeah, no, they, they lived over there. And then you had other people over here, you know, Bill Titla. Was up in Yonkers, I believe, and wow. Um, so not far from New York City. So he was, you know, I think he died in seventy one or seventy two. But yeah, he's got a great story too. Yeah, but you know, when I grew up, I liked Casper the Friendly Ghost. I really loved yeah. Casper the Friendly Ghost, and you know, Harvey Tunes. Yeah, I grew out of that when I was like five. But right. sure, um, but those were produced in Manhattan. And wow. and the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because when I moved back from Los Angeles, I moved to Wontaw, and literally I could walk there. Maybe six or seven blocks was the guy who animated and directed those. His name was Myron Waldman, right? And uh, not Bill, not related to Bill Waldman. Right. But this, but this guy. Uh, basically worked on all those Fleischer cartoons. He worked on all those early Popeyes and right. Eddie Boops and uh, 
And yeah, and I didn't know that. Somebody actually oh. told me, I think it was a UPS driver because he was delivering something or uh, might've been FedEx and delivering a storyboard or something like that. And I said, Oh yeah, I've been waiting for this. And, uh, and they said, uh, do you do animation? Cause he saw it said it was Warner brothers. Right. And so, yeah, uh, do you, Warner, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you, do you work in animation? I said, yeah, I'm a, a artist. And he said, Oh, it's funny. Uh, you know, uh, right across the parkway here, you know, is, uh, Myron Waldman. And, uh, I was like, really? <laughs> so it's a, wow. It's weird, yeah. And so that yeah, you know, but being in New York, I imagine you'd try to find anybody that you could, to, you know, that you know did what you want to do, and uh, you know, and just talk to them, and, you know. Yeah, but I didn't. I mean, you know, there were, it's not like these guys were advert. You know, all the people I wanted to talk to were on the West Coast, right? Um, yeah, oh, sure. With the exception of Preston Blair, because I yeah. I I got one of those Preston Blair art books by Walter Foster yeah. Books, and it said and that he lived in Westport, Connecticut. Yeah, sure. So I called him up. So I used to when I was going to school, when I was going to school trying to learn animation, and and right. art, I would call him up and ask him about you know different things like you know what's an extreme, what's an in between, you know. Um, what what does it mean by rough? Because I didn't know what rough meant, you know. Right. And he said, "Well, you know, you right. got to build it with construction lines and stuff." I didn't know that. Right. Just asking those basic questions, you know, and it's like, you know, S- simple questions you now. Simple questions. Yeah, but they're but yeah, they're, they're simple. But when you don't know it, they're complex. Oh, it's really complex because cause you're not coming from that you, you're not exactly from that, that world. world, you know. Exactly. It's like, you know, you're a little kid and you see these great athletes on TV and you want to do that. And it's, you know, it's very complex. It takes years of training and all these things to do things they do. It's the same in art field that we're in sometimes, you know, and uh, years of practice training and uh, focus and, you know. Right. And that's what it takes, you know, for me. It was the same way, you know, I just seeing these guys and wanted to just, you know, my my hero, I mean, it's part of you know, the people that I, one person I think, Nine Old Man, out of all the Nine Old Man Disney artists, Mark Davis was my guy, you know. Yeah. And he was a great draftsman, great animator. I remember the first time I saw, I was at Disneyland, I was like seven or eight, I don't know, back in 68, 68, I think. And I was at Disneyland for the first time, the little kid. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I saw Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. And all the pirates he'd painted and drawn. And, and I looked at that and I thought, I mean, I'm eight years old and I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's, and I just wanted to draw like that. I just remember seeing that. And I said, if I could just draw like that, you know, someday and be that kind of artist, you know, and then I found out later who it was and Mark Davis. And I was just like hooked on his stuff and everything he animated, Cruella de Vil. Right. I mean, but uh, just the stuff that he had done in his, his entire career, he had never animated before. And his first character that he actually got to really direct or work on, you know, major character was Flower from Bambi. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and Walt saw his potential. Walt, he came out of art school. He's a fine artist. And he brought him in. And here's Milt Call. He'd already been there for a year or two already. And, and he, he put on, put, he saw the draftsmanship in, in Mark Davis and Milk Hall had the same attributes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he gave Mark Davis to Milk Hall and said, make him an animator, you know? And that and Mark Davis was like, he had never really animated before. And he became, I think, a pretty good animator. He did. And, uh, great draftsman, great animator. I mean, he, was the he was the guy man to me and uh just wonderful and uh, that was the guy that i kind of just looked up to you know and still did yeah i um i looked up to milt call milt call i i just wanted to draw like milt call oh milt call yeah everybody man everybody just talked about milt call man yeah that guy he and and mark davis i think were the two best draftsmen in the whole i mean they were all great uh, trust me, they're, all these guys are great draftsmen and artists at their own right, but I'd say Mark Davis and Milk Hall were the two finest draftsmen and animators they had at the time. So I'll, I'll tell you, when I um, 
I was flown out to the blues studio when I was, I think it was yeah. 19. I think it was 19. And um, they had cars back then. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> they had cars back then. <laughs> they had cars back then. Yeah. Yeah. They were, yeah, but they were being pulled by horses. <laughs> so, yeah, they, but, they had just created vulcanized rubber, and they were pulling. Okay, anyway. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but everybody, in the, I, but I met you know a lot of the animators there, and uh, right. John Pomeroy, and of course, you know, I ended up, you know, we ended up working for him later, but but um, but I was going around the studio and uh, talking to Skip. Jones and uh, Dave Spafford, who, you know, both tremendous animators and great, you know, yeah, sure. draftsmen. And they had drawings up from John Lounsbury. And wow. And they were all saying, I just want to, I'd be happy if I could just draw like John Lounsbury. Wow. But they were all yeah, really like very John. capable draftsmen, you know. Oh, yeah. They were all, yeah. I mean, it's hard to pick out one and say he was better than this guy because they all. Those guys are all great in their own right. You yeah, know? and even, so. you know, Will Finn at the time, you know, I just saw some of the stuff he was doing, and I thought he was a great artist. You know, I mean, they were all impeccable, you know? Right. And they were they were where you wanted to be. They were at where you wanted to be. Oh, absolutely. So. Absolutely. Well, you know, I fell in love with that Bluth look because it was, it, to me, it was an extension of Milt Call anyway. For Right, sure. But anyway... I just I just want to go back into like when you got into when you got your job over at uh, was it at Marvel doing Muppet Babies or yeah it was yeah Muppet Babies yes and I a matter of fact uh, uh, my first job I got hired by uh, Bill uh, Bill Richardson who was an animator at the Baby Freeling back in the Pink Panther days and all the background artists that were working on it the old timers they all worked they all came out of the Baby Freeling man they all worked with. Uh, Fritz Freeling and the old Pink Panthers, Blue Aardvark, you name it. So DePatty and, uh, was actually running, he was running that studio, right? Uh, you know, no, Marvel, you mean? Yeah. Wasn't he, uh, wasn't he an executive you know, there? Or? Uh, you know what? I don't, I don't, I, when I started there, this is back in 85, I don't think he was there, to tell you the truth. I think, um, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, I honestly wouldn't be able to tell you because I never saw him there. Right. You know, but uh, Bill Richardson, who was our director, he was the head. He ran the whole operation of Muppet Babies. Mm -hmm. And when we first started, um, we were invited down to the director's guild to hear, uh, you know, um, uh, the, you know, uh, Muppet Babies creator, uh, my brain. Henson? Help me. Yeah, Jim Henson. He was going to be doing a talk. Oh, wow. And so uh, that was, you know, we just got, I just got hired there. Uh, my old my roommate and myself and a few other guys are, you know, they've directed in the industry already, but, uh, we we're just starting out. And, uh, so we got there, we heard his talk, heard the history of, uh, Henson, how he got started, a little film. And, uh, he talked for a little bit, brought Kermit out and everybody loved it. And then we were sitting down in front mm-hmm. and they had everybody leave after he was done. He walked off stage. Everybody left the auditorium. They brought the four of us up on stage and we were standing around the podium where he spoke, and then he comes walking out, and he met with us, right. and we're saying, okay. And he was excited that we we're going to be working on it, and that his team up in New York, we were going to be animating the Muppets, and it's based off his characters that he'd done from Muppets Take Manhattan. You know, when they had you first saw the Muppet Babies, the Muppet Babies, you know, right? But yeah, in you know the live action. And, and so they wanted that to take spurred, that. That spurred on all the other baby shows. Yes. And he thought, hey, that would be great. So we had to take those designs. And they had, he had some really good artists up there that designed the puppets and stuff and that drew the characters. And uh, oh, we yeah. worked at his group up mm-hmm. in New York. And uh, we had to make it work for animation. So, so that must, was... You must have been know. working with Michael Frith. That could have been, yeah. That was, name escapes me, but yeah, we I we we did a lot of their art. That facts over, you know, I'm saying facts for all of you out there no longer around, that in the rotary phone. But yeah, they fax all this stuff over to us. <laughs> and all all this art and uh and they were great stuff and and uh and I think Michael Fripp and a few other people, you know, from Kermit to Fozzie Bear, but all as babies, right? Right. Did and they, uh, so did, we took did they bring over any of the Muppets for you to kind of like 
look at or um and if they had I would have thrown them in my car and drove away dude. <laughs> but no no they didn't had man I mean I wish yeah, I wish that that could have been the case, but no, they just sent model sheets of actually all the drawings they did for the actual puppet. Right. So you oh, got wow. to see their their thought process and designing. You know, the, the, when that puppet got made, you know how they draw them. Mm-hmm. You know, and they did turnarounds and stuff of what the, the puppet should look like. So right, and he had a good team of artists, and they were just wonderful drawings. And uh, so we had to take that, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, so that's how I got started, and then uh, you, you were- know. Were you a designer right from the get-go or a junior designer? Uh, or Yeah, I got hired as a model designer. Wow. A model designer from up the Babies. There are four of us on the whole team. Right. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and believe it or not, you know, it was Marvel Productions, and there was this guy sitting upstairs. Some of you may know who he was, but he went by the name of Stan Lee. Who's he? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, you know, I've talked to you about this, but I, I, hadn't, I, was, in a con- I was not – Folks, I was not a comic book guy. I just, I was all about Disney and those artists and animation and blah, blah, blah. Right. I so you, you, comic can, books. you can give a, give a, a you know what? About, about, who? about the comics. Yeah, it's yeah. not like I hated them. I mean, my cousin Chuck, I remember growing up, my cousin Chuck had, used to have a whole box full of comic books and I would read Spider-Man and Thor, you know. Right. And uh, Captain America, I loved them, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I didn't have them because, you know, it cost, took money and I didn't get an allowance and I had to work for it. I got right. my first job when I was 13 building papers. But so any money that I made, I was quite frugal with because I knew how hard it was to make it. And I didn't just go willy nilly and go out and buy and blow all my money, you know. So mm-hmm. uh, but here is there, when I just started Marvel. Now, uh, I remember seeing him walking around and people would talk to him like he's a you know, I just thought he was a producer. I thought he was a big shot. He was upstairs, and he's just one of the big shots, you know. Right, but he, and, was, uh, he was pretty old at that time, wasn't he? He was, uh, he was, he was, he was almost you know, 100 he then. Look, he, yeah. he, 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 you know, him, I mean, this was back in 85, so he was energetic. He, was, he, was, he, he just was a young guy at heart. He walked that way, talked that way. He was just a motivating type of guy. He, he could have been a great football coach, let's put it that way. He was just a good motivator, good, just a generally nice nice guy right and so i'd run into him all the time and i, I thought I, you know just said hi and then he poked his head in i showed him what i was doing one time and and then after that as a week rolled on he took his head in and he goes matt how are those mother babies coming all right great stan you know blah 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 <laughs> and so one day i'm walking down the hall and he stops me hey how you doing matt i'm doing great stan blah 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 and he talks to me just for like 10 seconds five seconds right right and as I'm walking by, he walks by me upstairs, and a couple of guys are just staring at me. And they go, "Wow, that's pretty cool that you know you guys, you know, uh, you know, how do you know Stan? You know, he's walking around, I guess, you know, <laughs> I don't know." And and he goes, and they're just staring at me. He goes, "You know who that is, right?" I go, "Yeah, that's Stan." And they're just staring at me. It's it's Stanley. <laughs> they go. They go it's Stanley. That, that's Stan Lee. Yes. Stan Lee. Yeah. I go, Stan Lee, Stan Lee. I'm thinking to myself, where have I heard that? They're thinking I was the stupid. Where did I just come off the, the, the farm in Montana or something like that? I mean, I <laughs> I didn't have a clue. I mean, the name kind of sounded familiar to me, but I go, and they're just staring at me. They go, uh, Spider-Man, Thor, Captain America. And they're just going, <laughs> he created all that. You know, that's Stan Lee. He's the writer. He did it now. And you're like, well, so? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. no, no. What did he say that? I go, oh. oh. I, and I, I, think, I think the first thing that went through my mind was, what's he doing at a cartoon studio that's where, where we're doing Muppet Babies? You know? It's like, this is smart. I know he's, he's Captain America. And I'm working on Muppet Babies. What's he doing here? You know, I, I think that's what the first thing that popped in my head. But once they told me that, I think I went up to his office one time, and uh, well, I did, and I just poked my head in. He go, hey, come on in, Matt. And we talked for like 10 minutes. He told me his story. In, he lived in New York. He came back out of the Army. He was in the military during World War II, and he wanted to be a writer. And he was just telling me a story, and I remember this big Captain America shield being on the wall. Right. And then uh, and we just talked for like, I would say, gosh, 10 minutes. And it was kind of cool. And uh, I love just, he was so important in my, I guess when you, when somebody's starting out to have somebody like that in your corner, just, 
you know, just talk to you, you know, and encourage you and just, but not talk art, you know, just talk about life, you know, just, he's just a nice guy. And, uh, that was cool for me to, to know that and walk out of there and thinking, oh, Stanley, you know, he's just a, you know, everybody, you know, he's supposed to be something and everybody, you know, he's supposed to be way up there and I'm not, but he was just like, like your dad, he would just talk to you and, you know, about stuff and tell him a little about himself, and, you know. You know, I'm glad he got to see the success of some of these movies now uh, where these these characters have been reimagined for for modern day audiences. And uh, Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, because yeah. I think he was involved with... He was involved with most of those movies, I guess, as an executive producer. But I, you yeah, know, I don't know if uh, the monetary reward was there. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny that you said that too, because I think the only people that really knew who he was at that time were, were people that read comic books. Yeah, pretty much, um, and, 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 and nobody took that seriously. Could, yeah, and it's like you know, and so I think, and so once the movie started coming out, like you said, in his older years and stuff. Now everybody knows who Stanley was. I mean, everybody on that respects Stanley, the man, you know, it's like, wow, he did this and that and the other. And, yeah, you know, but I the, think for him, he wasn't looking for, oh, now I'm famous and this and that. He just sincerely loved what he did and he liked writing and he liked telling stories and that was his whole thing. And he, up until the day I think he passed away, he was just happy to be doing the thing he did way back when, up until the day he, he you know, passed away you know and uh i think that's the kind of guy he was you know he just loved writing and just being around people he was a people person you know and young people and uh, encouraging and uh you know that's the type of person he was yeah it's a pretty amazing story yeah Yeah. so for me that was kind of cool so what happened okay so muppet babies you're working on saturday morning thing yes and did it they didn't do a primetime special with it, did they? Or was that after? Or I, I, uh, I, I thought they did a primetime special with Muppet Babies. They did, and uh, they did a lot of things. They even tried doing the adult Muppets and stuff, and Muppets in Space. They tried to uh, go off a couple of the shows they had on the Muppet, the Muppet Show at the time, the live action. Right. And they tried to... Uh, in the anime, when I left there, they were working on that, Muppets in Space. They tried a season of that with the adult Muppets. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny too, because after that, I had a buddy of mine that I went to CalArts with, and he was just starting at Disney. And he said, Matt, you got to send your portfolio over here. You got to come over here. And I said, I'm not, I was very particular. He said, Your portfolio is fine. Just wait it, man. Just get over here. And I thought, No, I've got to be, it's got to be right. You know, I'm thinking it's got to be right. I got to do this. I ended up, when I left Muppets or when I left Marvel, I ended up doing some stuff at Deke. I did some designs and stuff, but I also worked on the Teddy Ruxpin. You remember the talking bear? I do. I, I, I do. Did. Was, I, uh, I worked on the, uh, the voice yeah. was uh, Mr. Ryan, Will Ryan, who passed away. Yeah. Will time. Ryan. He yeah. just passed away. Right. Yeah. I think he did both voices. He did. Um, yeah. Yes. Grubby and uh, Teddy. And Teddy. Yeah. And yeah, he's a but, very talented guy. Yeah, very talented. I got to meet him there. He had a little corner office and stuff like that. But yeah, Will Ryan, great voice guy. But uh, I worked on, I did the first three books of, uh, I worked on three books for Teddy Ruxpin. Oh, and wow. then, or Teddy Ruxpin. And mm-hmm. I think I did a one or two Mother Gooses. Oh, okay. and uh And then I left there, and that's, that's when I headed it over to Disney. And I got, I finally, you know. Wasn't it a Disney guy that, that started Teddy Ruxpin? Wasn't it? A, you know, like an, 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 I thought it was an Imagineer. I thought it was a. It, you know, it could have been because I used to. Man, I used to wander all around that studio, mm-hmm. and they're called. It was called Alchemy too. That's where they did it. Right. And I remember going downstairs where they did all the clothing. Gal, they did all the seamstresses. You know, they did all the clothing and stuff. Right. Right. And the guys that they were from Caltech, they did all the robotics. And they were, and they literally, they were in a cubicle or next to me. Okay. And they would buy, they would go to, and these guys had, must have had fun because they, they would go to the toy store. They were given a set amount of money, right? Like right. just, you know, would it be a hundred bucks, 200 bucks? And they'd buy a bunch of mechanical toys that hopped or skipped and jumped and flipped around and whatnot. And they'd tear the skin off it the fur off it just to see how things work. Right. 
And those are the guys that were behind Teddy Ruxpin, you know, how things worked and what they can do from the next level of talking animals and stuff. These guys were fun. And I got to sit next to them and I was, I was more intrigued with what those guys were doing than what I was doing. I was like, wow, man, this is, I'm geeking out a little bit. This is cool, you know. Yeah, I have uh, and, I have uh, an interest in animatronics since I have the puppet background. And I right. uh, actually went, not, not at Disney, because I didn't know anybody at Disney that would take me behind the scenes, but I met um, a guy by the name of Gene Poor who wrote a book about animatronics, and he was in... Um, I believe he was in, I, I want to say Idaho. It wasn't Idaho. It was Ohio. Right. And uh, I was directing a show, uh, had a, and we were using Star Tunes in Chicago for the animation. So I drove from New York to Chicago to supervise for a couple of weeks. And Gene Poor had this animatronics place in Ohio. So... Right. I, I called him up. I said, I'm an animator. I said, I really have an interest in this. You know, is there any way I can come and visit your studio? And he was like in the middle of nowhere. I just remember it being like, you know, in Sticksville, you know, not in the middle of right. the desert. But I mean, it was just like, you know, I had to, you know, go off course, maybe about 60 miles to get to get to this place. And he showed me around. He had a very interesting animatronics. I mean, I, I think he could have worked for Disney. You know, it was just uh, so good. Uh, some of the stuff. Well, like yeah, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. You know? But that's, inter- but that's interesting first because first uh, I was playing around with uh, Teddy Ruxpin back in the in the 90s, like some of the older figures, to try to build my own figure. That was That's a, really? that's a side thing. I, I wanna, I, let's not even go there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not going there, buddy. Yeah, thank you. So, um, okay, so you're working for Alchemy Two, and that, yeah. and you were there for a little while, and then you went over to I was Disney. There. I was, yeah, I was there for a little while, and then I ended up. Uh, I just said, I'm, I'm my portfolio is ready. I think where I wanted to be, and I got hired at Disney, and I I got hired at Disney first. To, in the bungalow, I was going to be storyboarding on Little Mermaid. They were just getting started on Little Mermaid. Oh wow! And I got to walk around the bungalows and stuff like that, meet all the guys, Matt Callahan, a few other people, and stuff. And they were just doing a tremendous job. And I, and I'm thinking, wow! I and I told them they just looked at my portfolio. They said, yeah, you could be a good board artist, you know. And I thought I never really storyboard other than my own little student film. I really never boarded anything, you know. And and they didn't care, you know. They just wanted me there and. uh so I did that. I that's where they first initially hired me, and then I ended up going over to Oliver and Company, and I was just I was uh, like a rough in betweener for uh, Handel Boutoy, a lot of his stuff, and a few other guys that worked there. And uh, Handel was a great guy, great animator. Now you went and, from uh, you went from story work to the animation, feature animations. Well, my when, when I first started, I wanted to be an animator, and they said, "Okay, well, you know what? We're going to search out as a rough in betweener." You know, right? So. I did, you know, it's almost like for me, it was like getting my hands on the animation and doing a rough in between some stuff like that. And I, and, you know, Hendel, I, I loved working with Hendel. I mean, he was just a tremendous animator and a uh, great guy to work under. And, uh, he, he helped me a lot as far as just, you know, understanding how animation, how, what they want and how to do it mm-hmm. at that level. And, uh, he just made it so easy for me to, you know, you know, whatever nurse I had, it was gone in a few days because just working with Handel, especially he was just a great guy. And, uh, yeah, it's great when you have somebody like that, that's, uh, they're supporting you, you know, they're, they oh, recognize yeah. your ability and they're, they're just cheering you on and just helping. Oh, yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. It's like not, not taking it and saying, you know, this is not right. You think and, you know, try again. And, you know, I think a few times I caught, I, I caught a few things that, you know, it just didn't look right. So I said, hand out, you know, I'm trying to, in between this, I'm trying to do this one drawing. I think it should be a key. And I don't know. I just, you know, what do you think? He goes, yeah, you know what, Matt? I did a few times. He goes, you know, that's my bad. He goes, I, I needed to throw in a key there. That's, that's my fault. I, that, that's an animator drawing. And, you know, I'm glad you caught that, you know, and I, I think he appreciated just the fact that I was, I was there at that level where I could, you know what how it should be and what you know i never i definitely didn't go in there and say and i'll do this again man it's not right you know i was just i i thought it was my i thought you know i'm trying to do this drawing here and it just doesn't seem right i mean you can't look at it and you look at it and go i don't know it's not you it's 
just I left the drawing out. You're right. Thanks for catching that. And blah blah blah. And I ended up getting to animate my first scene on that film after this. Uh, was going to be after a mermaid was going to be uh, uh, rescuers down under, and he wanted me over in development with him. Is he was going to be directing with Mike Gabriel? Oh wow! And so while they were and while they were working on uh, Little Mermaid, I would and man, I was like, this is where I want to be, man. I want to be in development, animation. I, I'm in hog heaven. Exactly. And at that time they were putting everybody under contract and I didn't want, I, I worked a certain way and I, you know, I don't want to get into it, but, uh, they wanted to put me in a, a contract or have me work their way. And I couldn't do that, you know? Right. And I left, I left. Wow. Studio. I left and I didn't look back and, uh, all my buddies couldn't figure it out. Why are you leaving there? You get your gold card. You, oh, man, what are you doing? I said, well, I just, you know, I, I don't work that way. I want to be an independent. I want to be free to do other things. Yeah, because and when, so you're, on, when but, you're locked into a contract, there's, if, if you want to do something the next year, or let's say something comes up and you need to be right. somewhere. Right. You can't. Right. Or, and at, they own and their you. contract. Yeah. yeah, they own me. So, so, but I left, but you know what? I'd have never met the great Brian Mitchell, you know? Who's he? My, oh, man, he's a big shot. He's, he's something else, man. I think he moved just out of the industry, and he's back back in New York, and it's all stop the ground. But, yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I, I left there to go. They had six people come back from Ireland from Blue to start a studio back in L.A. because John wanted to come back. And, and so, Linda Miller, all these great artists and stuff, you know, John, started. You're referring to John Pomeroy. Yeah, John, one of the, and one they of the, all came. One of the and, greats, one of the greats. Yeah, yeah, John, man, what a great guy, a great animator, you know. And Linda Miller too. I mean, people don't think they know Miller. She was just an incredible draftsman. Oh, she was. She was an animator. An, she was an amazing animator. Well, she, yeah. she probably, I'm sure she still is. She's, oh, she. Um, if she still wants to do it, I mean, she wanted to be a writer too. But Linda was great, and uh, and so they were. They just came back, and I said, I'm gonna. I, I just walked right into Blizz, and literally. Within a week from leaving Disney, I was working at Blue. Wow. And that's, you know, my Blue story. And, uh, so was, was, did was, you, you started over, you were, uh, you were over at West Olive, right? Yes, West Olive, right? Right on Olive Boulevard. So, just in case if people don't understand, Bluth, Don Bluth moved his entire studio to Cal, uh, from California to Ireland for tax benefit. And so they were in Van Nuys, California, and then they, they all got, I guess they all got up and they, they left. Yep. And, um, they set up this giant studio in, in Ireland in Dublin. Yeah. And, uh, I, and the way I hear it or the way I heard it was certain people only gave them a two year commitment. So at the end of the two years, I think the, I, I think they thought it was wonderful, but they wanted to come back to California. And so, uh, instead of losing these people, they decided to set up this, uh, I want to say, covert operation. <laughs> <laughs> they set up this satellite studio where, was how many people were in there? I think maybe 20, I think it was like initially 20 people. I, I well, back was, in L.A.? Yeah. Well, the, the, what? they called it West Olive Incorporated. So, yeah. Yeah. So basically, you know, they were. But here's how, actually, here's how it went down. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like what you're saying there. But when I started working there, it was John Palmer, Linda Miller, and like four or five others. That was it. Right. I and they were Mark, up in this Mark little, Christensen was working there. But Mark came later. Oh, I okay. got there before Mark. Oh, Mark okay. came later. Because when and I got there, I was he was there. gone. He was long gone. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was just that they had, listen, they had just got there. They had been in this office space for literally i want to say a week and a half two weeks lorna lorna was there john and linda miller and they had i think three or uh three other artists that a background artist i think it was sunny sunny and uh yeah uh, sunny was was there. I, I, I don't remember it was like our pitch account our pitch upon something like that yeah I'm, I'm probably yeah sunny was right phenomenal now. and then there was yeah. another there was another one they had there too that he, he worked at disney back in the day and he actually uh, he was another great background artist they had there too, and uh, Larry Lieber. Larry Leaker. Larry Leaker. Larry, that's it. Larry Leaker. Mm-hmm. Larry Leaker, and that was it. And they came back is because John had just gotten married in Ireland, and he wanted to come back to. He wanted. He was 
kind of missing, you know, at home. And he said, you know what? And they had talked about, you know what? All right. You know, we'll send a group of you, small group of you back to, to Los Angeles and uh, get some of the talent, talent pool out there. They were using a lot of Irish, you know, artists and stuff and giving a lot of, you know, chances to a lot of young uh, Irish, you know, talent. Right. But they, a lot and of so, them, a lot of them, they're talented, but green. Yeah. And they're so, very talented. Yeah. And so, so when they came back, so that's what they want to do. They want to step here and try to, you know, you know, collect some of this local talent. And, uh, yeah, so there you go. And, uh, we were working on, uh, you know, that's how I started. I just went right into it, man, with these guys. And so, and then, it, then graduate, cause they were still back in Ireland. The major part of the studio was still in Ireland. Right. Okay. And, yeah, uh, was, Donald would come back every now and take a trip back and forth, you know, every now and then. But, uh, he, they were there for another, uh, at least four or five years after that. Well, so, I came in, I came into West Olive, I think it was late 89, yeah, yeah, late in that sounds about I think right. All dogs go to he- they were still working on All Dogs, uh, go, to all heaven, dogs right? go to Heaven. So I came in on the tail end of the All Dogs. Right. Yeah, um, and I was there at the kind of the beginning of it. So Right. So I came in and I I applied I heard that they were in town. I heard, you know, and I was trying to figure out where they were and I found out it was West Olive. And it was a weird shaped building with a breeze. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it was above, it was above a, another office space. And we were on the top. Remember they had that stairs that went up and we we're on that top level. We're in the top it level of like an H shaped building. If yeah. You down, and the parking structure below us and stuff, a little walkway across the parking structure. Right. Interesting studio, but boy, it was like, uh, you know, people would say, oh yeah, they're right over there by NBC. And I'm like, yep, that was I, across the street. Yeah, I had a hard, I really had a hard time trying to find it. And then I got in contact with, <laughs> I got in contact with uh, John Pomeroy. Yeah, I just wanted to get in as an in betweener. Right. And so I took an in between test, and he said it looks pretty good, but he said we don't really need an in betweener right now. He said, but uh, would you mind taking a, an animation test? So it was uh, Charlie the dog jumping over a box. Box, right. Sure, I'm going to test you. And uh, so I did that test, and uh, and I sweated it out. (laughs) I was sweating bullets. Again, you know, I was like, it gave you two hours. This is my one shot. If I don't do this, it's back in New York. What what was that? No, I said, no, I'm I'm just thinking. And now you're sweating it out. It's like, I don't know. This is back in New York. That's right. No, My I was art work- teacher was right all these years. She was right. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was work- I was actually working at uh, I was working at Bakshi's. Okay. And then I was working at Deke, and then uh, doing some other stuff around town, animating. Right. But uh, n- you know, but really fast and very cheap stuff, and and uh, right. So when that opportunity came around, and they gave me the Charlie jumping over the box or jumping on the box test. Right. I was sure. like, "Oh crap!" You know, I'm going through it. And I'm, like, I'm roughing it out. I'm like, "Oh, this this is gonna this is gonna stink." He's, right. gonna, he's gonna look at this and he's gonna say, "Boy, you know, you're 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 a piece of work." <laughs> <laughs> so I did I did it, and I you know I just I I handed it to him and. And, uh, you know, I said goodbye and, uh, you know, I, I slunk down. <laughs> slunk down. <laughs> and, uh, he called, he called me up the next morning and he said, you know, it looks pretty good. He said, your test looks really? pretty good. Yeah. And he said, uh, there you go, man. Said, can you they, start? When, when can you start? You're going to work under Matthew. You know this guy, Matthew Bates? No, no. <laughs> You're going to do the spots on the on the dog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Matt's going to have the dog you in your clean those up. <laughs> well, welcome back to the cartoonerific podcast, Classic Animated Cartoons. That was part two of our Matt Bates interview. Uh, I know I said that uh, we'd have a new guest every week. When we were uh, when I was doing this interview with Matt, it went so well 
and we're having so much fun doing it that it ended up being over two hours long. And rather than cut it down to a measly 45, 50 minutes, figured we'd break it down. So last week was Inspirations. This week was uh, a lot of the places that Matt has worked at and his experiences working with different people. Next week, it's going to be uh, some of the different challenges, some of the, uh, some of the things that he's uh, worked on in recent uh, years, including a fan film called The Wonderful World of Walt, which was done through Creative Capers, which I happen to really like a whole lot. Um, so I hope you come back and see us next week. That should be the final Matt Bates episode. We'll probably talk again with him uh, sometime down the line, I hope. Uh, I had a lot of fun with this interview, and I hope you've enjoyed it too. If you're liking what you're hearing... Uh, please subscribe to this podcast. You could do that uh, through www.cartoonerific.com. You could subscribe to our website as well and uh, check out all the unique stuff there. Our podcasts, like I said uh, earlier, are posted every, every week at 12 in the morning, Friday morning. So if you're listening, you know, if you're up Thursday night and you can't wait for that next episode, the next episode uh, actually gets posted at 12 midnight, and uh, you, you can listen to the episode before anybody else gets a chance to listen to it. So we hope you do that. Anyway, uh, I am Brian Mitchell, and uh, thank you again for tuning in. Please have a wonderful, cartoonerific week. We hope to see you again soon. And thank you for listening. This has been a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. The Cartoonerific Podcast is copyright 2024 by Cartoonerific Studios Incorporated. All rights reserved.